Hello, it's Rafael Gutierrez, and today I'm going to be talking about the appendicular skeletal system. There are some things that is really important for you to know uh, before we even look at it, and I am going to use my uh, lab manual to help me out. Uh, the pictures I do have on the lab manual are fair use. That means that anyone can use them. If you really love them, you can uh, go to the NIH website and they have a list of all these uh, images. Now, uh, there are some words that are really important for you to know, especially if you're going to try to understand the axial uh, I'm sorry, the appendicular bones. One of them is medial. If you remember the first video, I talked about medial is going to the midline. Opposite wise would be lateral. So medial, lateral. We've also talked about superior, meaning above, inferior, meaning below. And we talked about those in the other with the uh, supraorbital, supra and superior, or different times are used, supraorbital uh, foramen here, infraorbital foramen here. And so we talked about superior and inferior like that. We also talked about uh, anatomical position, and that is your hands are pointing, your palms are pointing forward, your hands are pointing, uh, your palms are pointing forward, your thumbs are pointing laterally, your face is forward, and that's what we're going to be using the body in, is anatomical position. The other one that's really important for you to know is the difference between proximal and distal. Proximal, again, means closer to the midline, uh, distal, meaning away from the, uh, away from the torso. Proximal is closer to the torso, just away from the torso. And then the other thing I want you to know is what articulations are. Now articulations are pretty much joints. Now before we talked about sutures, and I did kind of mention the temporal mandibular joint, which is a joint between the um, mandible and the temple, temporal bone. And you, ha you do have a little thing, you do have a joint there that's important for you to know. And I know I'm going fast because, I, like I said, I want to keep this at less than 30 minutes, if possible. Uh, and so I figure two minutes of introduction should help. So with that, I'm going to start showing you pictures and tell you what certain things mean. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy this. So the first bone I want to talk about in the appendicular system is this one here, which is called the scapula. Now, if you look at it, it has roughly the shape of a triangle. So it really does tell us, really does give us a different way to look at it. Now, I'm going to get a piece of paper. I'm just going to draw a triangle. So, if we have a triangle and we have the spinal cord down here, this area here could be called the medial border. This one here would be lateral, and this one over here would be superior. Now, we can also look at the little angles of the triangles. We have the superior angle, inferior angle, and lateral angle. And so we do have these different names in the scapula. The other thing we see in a scapula is we have a spine, pretty much a pointy projection that comes up here. So we call it the spine of the scapula. Now the spine of the scapula has an area that hangs off, which is called the acromial limb. And it has two areas which are grooves which we call fossas. This one here is above the spine, so it's a supraspinatus fossa. The one underneath is the infraspinatus fossa. And now you have the back of the scapula. So if I were to show you this picture here, and I'm going to zoom in to the scapula, this one here, you can end up seeing the border here, here, and up here a little bit. So we have your medial, lateral, and superior border. We can see the spine and the acromium here. Now, you'll also notice that there's an area under it which rubs against the ribs. And that area is called your subscapular fossa. Sub under scapular fossa. Here you see the scapula as it sits in the rib cage. So you can see the subscapular fossa here. And you have this area here called the coronoid process. It's just a little finger-like projection here. Acromium here, cor 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 sorry, the coronoid here. And you can see this area here, which looks like a little bit of a head, which has the uh, glenoid cavity here. Glenoid cavity is this area here. And so we now have base the basics of the scapula. Now, the reason I went to the scapula first is so we can now talk about this bone here. This bone here is your clavicle, and the clavicle has two ends. One is a flat end here, one is a bumpy end here. 
Now, I told you how this is a chromium. So this here would be your acromial end. And then this area here would be your sternal end. One of the things that's important, nice to see with the clavicle is that you can see how different things are. Now the clavicle does have gro a groove and it does have a bump called the tuberosity, which you'll want to look at individually. Now, you also see in the glenoid cavity, you see this thing that looks like a head coming in here. And that's pretty much your humerus. I'm going to actually show you your humerus. There's your humerus. And what you'd see is you see this end here, which is a head, which fits, this is a head here, which fits into the glenoid cavity, making the glenohumeral joint. By looking at the other end here, you see these three lumps. This here is called your trochlea, and this one here is called your capitulum. And these are going to be important when we deal with the other bones too, so remember them. And you have fossas here, which I'll show you a little bit later. Now the other thing you have here is you have a little triangle shaped projection which is a tuberosity, and we call that one the deltoid tuberosity. We also have these two big lumps. So looking at the humerus here, you have the head, you have a neck here, neck here, the tuberosities. So you do have two necks, you have the surgical neck here. We also talked about, if you actually look down here, you'll notice that there's a projection here, which is a tuberosity, which we call the deltoid tuberosity. So, so far we have the head, anatomical neck, surgical neck, Greater tubercle, lesser tubercle, intertubercle fossa between it, uh, deltoid tuberosity. Now, as we go to the other side, we see this big area here, which is called the capitulum, and this area here called the trochlea. Now, we also see that there's a fossa here and a little one here. So we have a capitulum, C, and our trochlea here. You can think of these as two paired round shaped projections. So above them, you have your epicondyles. As you have two of them, you have an epicondyle here and here. This one here is pointing to the middle, so it'd be your medial epicondyle. This one here would be your lateral epicondyle. And that's actually the basics of the anterior portion of the humerus. If we to look at the posterior portion, we can, can see the, one of the tuberosities. We can see the anatomical and surgical neck, the deltoid tuberosity here. We can see the medial epicondyle here, lateral here. And we can see the trochlea here. And we see a fossa here. And this fossa is called your, this fossa here, is called your olecranon fossa. Now, the reason those are important is this. I told you about how you have fossas on the other side. One of them is, you can see here, you have your radial, what's called your radial fossa. And over here, you have your coronoid process. I'm sorry, coronoid fossa. So coronoid fossa is here, radial fossa is here. Now, the reason those are important is if we are to look at the elbow joint, we can see this here. This bone here is the radius. This here is the ulna. If you look at the radial head, you'll see how it's flat has kind of a rounded, it's, it is round, and it fits on the capitulum. And that fossa here is called the radial fossa because the radius fits into it. And that fossa here is called the radial fossa because the radius fits into it. On the ulna here, you have a little projection here called the coronoid process, and it fits into the coronoid fossa. And so that's why you can see what fits in where. When we look at the ulna, we notice that it goes straight and it gets thin. The radius gets bigger as it goes down. Now the bone, the, the bone that usually breaks is the radius right here, by the way. And the reason it breaks there is there's a, the weight of the, if you are to fall on your arm, the weight actually cut, comes here and then crosses over. So what happens is you usually take most of the blunt force here. Now that ends up breaking, uh, causing a break called the, uh, especially if it's on an outstretched hand as you're falling, called a uh, Collie's fracture. The ulna can break, usually it breaks here, called the, the nightstick fracture. It doesn't support the weight, but if someone were to try to block a blow of a nightstick with this, it breaks. That's why uh, in, if you are in martial arts, blocking with your forearm is not necessarily the best way to do it. So here again, we can actually see the humerus, and you can see the capitulum here, and part of the trochlea here, and you can see the radius coming down. You can see how the ulna works on the other side too straight down. Now, the, the bone that actually does allow you to move your hands up and around like that, up and around like this, is actually the radius where, where it can rotate here, and there's a little pivot on the, tri on the uh, head of the ulna. And I, that's all I'm going to talk about the ulna, because I want to actually go into hands. There are a lot more projections that, if you're in my class, you will have to know. Collectively, the bones here, these are the bones of the wrist, are called the carpals. Each bone does have a specific name, and if you are taking my class, you will have to know all of them. The one that is really important for most people to know is a scaphoid here, and there's one called the hamate, which has a hook here, a piso form here. Uh, 
These two are bones that tend to break, scaphoid by falling on an outstretched hand. The problem is scaphoid's a re really hard shaped bone to look at. So if you fall on the scaphoid and break it, it doesn't show up on x-ray, sometimes for about two weeks. During my class, I'll talk about that more. The hook of the handmaid is the other one, which is called a driver's fracture. And it used to happen when drivers were cranking the cars, it would fire and hit that. Now it actually happens through another driver, and that's in golf. If you hit the ground, you can end up hitting and hitting the handmaid, breaking it off. Besides that, we'll actually talk about these bones here. These five bones are called, carpals are the wrist, meta means next to, carpals here. So, the way you name them is this. The first one, your thumb, is going to be, these are the ones in the palm, bones of the palm of the hand, is going to be your first metacarpal. The pinky one is going to be your fifth metacarpal. So you're going to name them one, two, three, four, five. You can see that they have a base here and a head here. Sometimes people talk about the condyle of the metacarpals. That's this area here as well, in the shaft. Now there are a couple other projections that I'll have you learn if you're in my class, but for now, that's fine. Then we go into the fingers. Again, you have a base and a head here. All these past the metacarpals are called phalanxes. So you have a proximal phalanx. As this one's the farthest, it's a distal. And the one in the middle will be the middle. Four of your fingers are like that, but if you look at the thumb, you only have a proximal and a distal. When you're dealing with these joints, a lot of times people talk about the interphalangeal joints. And sometimes you'll see the initial PIP and DIP. PIP stands for proximal interphalangeal uh, joint. DIP is distal interphalangeal joint. So you're talking about either the joint here, which would be the distal interphalangeal joint, or the joint here, which would be the proximal interphalangeal joint. Now we actually have all the bones of the arm. The next thing I want to talk about is the hip bones here, which is a lot of times uh, referred to as the os coxae. Now, big thing to actually know is that this area here, that hole, the pelvic floor, is actually different in men and women. In men, you'll see more of a triangle shape. In women, it'll be more oval. The reason is it is part of the birth canal. Now, the other thing to look at is the os coxae here which what you have is you have different type, different bones depending on where you look at it. So we do have different bones here. Now one of the bones we have is this bone here, which is your pubic bone here. This is a pubic symphysis, which in this area you have fiber cartilage holding it together. That's important for childbirth. Birth canal is here, so this has to be able to stretch a little bit. You can actually break this apart here, and you have the pubic bone here. You then have the ilium, which is this bone here. And you have the ischium, which is this bone here. So ischium is a bone that you're actually going to sit on. Here you see the femoral head. You see the ilium. You see the ischium here. You can see a division here. You can see the pubic bone over here. So you can see all the bones. Now, one of the things is you do have an anterior and posterior. And the way you tell the anterior is the pubic bone is always going to be pointing anterior. And so this area is anterior, and one of the things you see in the ilium is you see two spines, anterior superior iliac spine, anterior inferior iliac spine. Your posterior superior and your posterior inferior, which is hard to see in this picture, but it would be around here. This area here is the iliac crest, and the iliac crest is really important because it is a special landmark where if you follow it, in a straight line to the other one and you go midway, you get to the lumbar region L4, L5. So we have your posterior superior, posterior inferior iliac spine, and then you have a spine here, which is part of the ischium. It's called the ischial spine. And you then have greater sciatic notch, your lesser sciatic notch. So the two sciatic notches. And you have a big lump on the back of the ischium, which is your ischial tuberosity. Like I showed you here, you have the head of the femur. And so we can see this, the head, the femur here. Now this area of the femur is the head, and this time we only have one neck, which is this area here. And we have a big lump here. Now this big lump has another lump on the other side here, which to some people look like a ship wheel. You have these little projections here. And these two have the same names. They are called the lesser and greater trochanters. So these two are the lesser and greater trochanters. Between the two current trochanters, you have what's known as a trochanteric line. In the back, you have this big, deep crest. So we call the inner trochanteric line here, inner trochanteric crest here. So we have the head, 
neck, inner trochanteric crest, inner trochanteric line, greater and lesser trochanters. We also do have a divot here. It's just called the fovea capitis. And then we have, at the end, two round wheel-like projections, which I told you were condyles. If you notice, anytime you see those projections like that, it's going to be a condyle, doesn't matter where they are. And you have a wing-like projection on the side here and here, called your medial and lateral epicondyle. This one here is medial, as you can see. Here is the head, so medial epicondyle, lateral is over here. You can feel these two on your uh, knee. You can also feel the greater trochanter on the lower portion of your hip. And you have an air surface here, which is called the popteal surface. If we turn it around, we have a surface here, which is called your patellar surface. And this is your patella. You can see that you have an, art an area to articulate here and another area and an apex if you're really into that type of thing. Now, over here, what you're seeing is you're seeing the tibia, which is this long bone here, and the fibula. Remember, the fib, you, uh, fib is a small bone that lies lateral to the tibia. Now, the tibia, you can feel to the tibia. Now, the tibia, you can feel all the way down the medial portion of your leg. So always know that the medial bone is a tibia, the lateral bone is a fibula. And you can feel the tibia all the way down from your patella comes in, in this lump called the tibial tuberosity, all the way down to, this is a medial malleolus. So you can feel it from the tibial tuberosity all the way to the medial malleolus. If you have a medial one, you also have a lateral one, which is on the fibula. Now, you do have a flat surface of the tibia, and you have a area up there which comes up, which is your inner condylar eminence. You have your tibial plateau. If you get down to the foot, we see that there are a lot of bones in the foot. Now, collectively, they are called the tarsals, and each one has its name. I'm just going to give you a couple names. So, for instance, this one here is a calcaneus. This one up here is a tallus. If you were to see the entire foot, you'd see it's, it looks like it'd be the one that is the highest up, so it looked like it might be the tallest. It's not. Just like in the hands, you have the metacarpals next to the carpals in the feet. These here are called your metatarsals, which are next to the tarsals. And the toes, just like the uh, fingers, were called the phalanxes. Again, you have the proximal and distal, and every other except for the big thumb, you have proximal, middle, and distal. That's the basics of skeleton. Hope you enjoyed this. Thank you very much.